Section 30 of Humorous Readings and Recitations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Humorous Readings and Recitations. Edited by Leopold Wagner. Section 30 artemus ward's visit to the tower of london by farhar brown i scarcely need inform you that the tower is very popular with people from the agricultural districts and it was chiefly them class which i found waiting at the gates the other morning i saw at once that the tower was established on a firm basis in the entire history of firm basises, I don't find a basis more firmer than this one. You have no tower in America, said a man in the crowd, who had somehow detected my denomination. A Lars, no, I answered. We boast of our enterprise and improvements, and yet we are devoid of a tower america o oh my unhappy country thou hast not got no tower it is a sweet boon the gates were opened after a while and we all purchased tickets and went into a waiting room my friends said a pale-faced little man in a black clothes that is a sad day inasmuch as to how I said i mean it is sad to think that so many people have been killed within these gloomy walls my friends let us drop a tear no i said you must excuse me others may drop one if they feel like it but as for me i decline the early managers of this institution were a bad lot and their crimes were truly awful but i can't sob for those who died four or five hundred years ago if they was my own relations i couldn't it's absurd to shed sobs over things which occurred during the reign of henry the three let us be cheerful i continued look at the festive warders in their red flannel jackets they are cheerful and why should it not be thusly with us a warder now took us in charge and showed us the traitor's gate the armors and things the traitor's gate is wide enough to admit about twenty traitors abreast i should judge but beyond this i couldn't see that it was superior to gates in general traitors i will here remark are the unfortunate class of people if they weren't they wouldn't be traitors they conspire to bust up a country they fail and they're traitors they bust her and they become statesmen and heroes take the case of gloucester afterwards old dick the three who may be seen at the tower on horseback in a heavy tin overcoat take mr gloucester's case mr g was a conspirer of the basest die and if he'd failed he would have been hung on a sour apple tree but mr g succeeded and became great he was slewed by colonel richmond but he lives in history and his equestrian figure may be seen daily for a sixpence in conjunction with other eminent persons and no extra charge for the warder's able and beautiful lecture there's one king in this room who is mounted onto a foaming steed his right hand grasping a barber's pole i didn't learn his name the room where the daggers and pistols and other weapons is kept is interesting among this collection of choice cutlery i noticed the bow and error 
which those hot-headed old chaps used to conduct battles with it is quite like the bow and error used at this date by certain tribes of american injuns and they shoot em off with such an excellent precision that i almost sighed to be an injun when i was in the rocky mountain region they are a pleasant lot them injuns mr cooper and dr caitlin have told us of the red man's wonderful eloquence and i have found it so our party was stopped on the plains of utah by a band of shoshones whose chief said brothers the pale face is welcome brothers the sun is sinking in the west and wanabucky she will soon cease speaking brothers the poor red man belongs to a race which is fast becoming extinct he then whooped in a shrill manner stole our blankets and whiskey and fled to the primeval forest to conceal his emotions i will remark here while the on the subject of indians that they are in the main a very shaky set with even less sense than the fenans and when i hear philanthropists bewailing the fact that every year carries the noble red man nearer the settin sun i simply have to say i'm glad of it though it is rough on the settin sun they call you by the sweet name of brother one minute and the next they scalp you with their thomas hawks but i wonder let us return to the tower at one end of the room where the weapons is kept is a wax figure of queen elizabeth mounted on a fiery stuffed horse whose glass eye flashes with pride and whose red marker nostril dilates haughty as if conscious of the royal burden he bears i have associated elizabeth with the spanish armadi she's mixed up with it at the surrey theatre where two to the core is being acted and in which a full bally core is introduced on a board the spanish admiral's ship given the audience the idea that he intends opening a mosaic hall in plymouth the moment he conquers that town but a very interesting drummer is two to the core notwithstanding the eccentric conduct of the spanish admiral and very nice it is in queen elizabeth to make martin truegold a baronet the warder shows us some instruments of torture such as thumbscrews throat collars etc stating that these were conquered from the spanish amardi and adding what a cruel people the spaniards was in them days which elicited from a bright-eyed little girl of about twelve summers the remark that she thought it was rich to talk about the cruelty of the spaniards using thumb screws which he was in a tower where so many people's heads had been cut off this made the warder stammer and turn red i was so pleased with the little girl's brightness that i could have kissed the dear child and i would if she had been six years older i think my companions intended making a day of it for they all had sandwiches sausages etc the sad-looking man who had wanted us to drop a tear before we started to go round flinged such quantities of sausage into his mouth that i expected to see him choke himself to death he said to me in the beauchamp tower where the poor prisoners writ their unhappy names on the cold walls this is a sad sight it is indeed i answered 
you're black in the face you shouldn't eat sausage in public without some rehearsals beforehand you manage it awkwardly no he said i mean this sad room indeed he was quite right though so long ago all these dreadful things happened i was very glad to get away from this gloomy room and go where the rich and sparkling crown jewels is kept i was so pleased with the queen's crown that it occurred to me what a agreeable surprise it would be to send a similar one home to my wife and i asked the warder what was the valley of a good well constructed crown like that he told me but on a ciphern up with a pencil the amount of funds i have in the gint stock bank i concluded i'd sent her a gentle silver watch instead and so i left the tower it is a solid and commandant edifice but i deny that it is cheerful i bid it adieu without a pang from punch by permission of the proprietors end of section 30 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc Section 31 of Humorous Readings and Recitations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Humorous Readings and Recitations. Edited by Leopold Wagner. Section 31 mr coddle has lent an acquaintance the family umbrella by douglas gerald that's the furred umbrella gone since christmas what were you to do why let him go home in the rain to be sure i am very certain that there was nothing about him that could spoil take cold indeed he doesn't look like one of the sort to take cold besides he'd have better taken cold than take our only umbrella do you hear the rain mr coddle i say do you hear the rain and as i am alive if it isn't st swithern's day do you hear it against the windows nonsense you don't impose upon me you can't be asleep with such a shower as that do you hear it i say oh do you hear it well that's a pretty flood i think to last for six weeks and no stirring all the time out of the house pooh don't think me a fool mr coddle don't insult me he returned the umbrella anybody would think you were born yesterday as if anybody ever did return an umbrella there do you hear it worse and worse cats and dogs and for six weeks always six weeks and no umbrella i should like to know how the children are to go to school to-morrow they shan't go through such weather i'm determined no they shall stop at home and never learn anything the blessed creatures sooner than go and get wet and when they grow up i wonder who they'll have to thank for knowing nothing who indeed but their father people who can't feel for their own children ought never to be fathers but i know why you lent the umbrella oh yes i know very well i was going out to tea at dear mother's to-morrow you know that and you did it on purpose don't tell me you hate me to go there and take every mean advantage to hinder me but don't you think it mr coddle no sir if it comes down in buckets full i'll go all the more no i won't have a cab where do you think the money 
is to come from. You've got nice high notions, that club of yours. A cab, indeed. Cost me sixteen pence, at least. Sixteen pence. Two and sixpence. For there's back again. Cabs, indeed. I should like to know who's to pay for em. I can't pay for em, and I'm sure you can't. If you go on as you do, throwing away your property, and beggaring your children, buying umbrellas. Do you hear the rain, Mr. Coddle? I say, do you hear it? But I don't care. I'll go to Mother's tomorrow. I will. And what's more, I'll walk every step of the way. And you know uh, that I will give me my death. Don't call me a foolish woman. It is you that's the foolish man. You know I can't wear clogs, and with no umbrella the wet's sure to give me a cold. It always does. But what do you care for that? Nothing at all. I may be laid up for what you care, as I dare say I shall. And a pretty doctor's bill there'll be. I hope there will. I will teach you to lend your umbrellas again. I shouldn't wonder if I caught my death, yes, and that's what you lent the umbrella for, of course. Nice clothes I shall get, too, traipsing through the weather like this. My gown and bonnet will be spoilt quite. Needn't I wear them, then? Indeed, Mr. Coddle, I shall wear em. No, sir, I am not going out a dowdy to please you or anybody else. Gracious knows, it isn't often that I step over the threshold, indeed. I might as well be a slave at once. Better, I should say, but when I do go out, Mr. Coddle, I choose to go like a lady. Oh, that rain, if it isn't enough to break in the windows. Ugh, I do look forward with dread for to-morrow. How am I to go to mother's? I am sure I can't tell, but if I die, I'll do it. No, sir, I won't borrow an umbrella. No, and you shan't buy one. Now, Mr. Coddle, only listen to this. If you bring home another umbrella, I'll throw it in the street. I'll have my own umbrella, or none at all. Ha! Huh. And it was only last week I had a new nozzle put to that umbrella. I'm sure if I'd had known as much as I do now, it might have gone without one for me, paying for new nozzles, for other people to laugh at you. Oh, it's all very well for you. You can go to sleep. You've not thought of your poor patient wife and your own dear children. You think of nothing but lending umbrellas. Men, indeed, call themselves lords of the creation, pretty lords, when they can't even take care of an umbrella. I know that walk tomorrow will be the death of me, but that's what you want. Then you may go to your club and do as you like, and then nicely my poor dear children will be used but then sir then you'll be happy oh don't tell me i know you will else you'd never have lent the umbrella you have to go on thursday about that summons and of course you can't go no indeed you don't go without the umbrella you may lose the debt for what i care it won't be so much as spoiling your clothes. Better lose it. People deserve to lose debts who lend umbrellas. And I should like to know how I'm to go to mother's without an umbrella. Oh, don't tell me that I said I would go. That's nothing to do with it. Nothing at all. She'll think I'm neglecting her, and the little money we were to have we shan't have at all because we've no umbrella. The children, too, dear things, they'll be sopping wet, 
for they shan't stop at home they shan't lose their learning it's all their father will leave em i'm sure but they shall go to school don't tell me i said they shouldn't you are so aggravating coddle you'd spoil the temper of an angel they shall go to school mark that and if they get their deaths of cold it is not my fault i didn't lend the umbrella at length writes coddle i fell asleep and dreamt that the sky was turned into a green calico with whalebone ribs that in fact the whole world turned round under a tremendous umbrella by permission of messrs bradbury agnew and company end of section thirty one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section thirty two of humorous readings and recitations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda olson fytak los angeles humorous readings and recitations edited by leopold wagner section thirty two domestic asides by tom hood i really take it very kind this visit mrs skinner i have not seen you such an age the wretch has come to dinner your daughters too what loves of girls what heads for painters easels come here and kiss the infant dears and give it perhaps the measles your charming boys i see are home from reverend mr russell's twas very kind to bring them both what boots for my new brussels what little clara left at home well now i call that shabby i should have loved to kiss her so a flabby dabby bubby and mr s i hope he's well ah though he lives so handy he never drops in now to sup the better for our brandy come take a seat i long to hear about matilda's marriage you've come of course to spend the day thank heaven i hear the carriage what must you go next time i hope you'll give me longer measure nay i shall see you down the stairs with most uncommon pleasure good-bye good-bye remember all next time you'll take your dinners now david mind i'm not at home in future to the skinners by permission of messrs ward lock and company end of section thirty two section thirty three of humorous readings and recitations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c humorous readings and recitations edited by leopold wagner section thirty three the charity dinner by vichafold mosley time half past six o'clock place the london tavern occasion fifteenth annual festival of the society for the distribution of blankets and top boots among the natives of the cannibal islands on entering the room we find more than two hundred noblemen and gentlemen already assembled and the number is increasing every minute there are many well-known city diners here this evening that very ordinary-looking personage with the rubicond complexion and pimply features is old moneypenny senior partner of the great firm of moneypenny blodgers and wobbles corn factors of mark lane he began the world as a fellowship porter and always makes a rule of attending the principal dinners at the london tavern because 
as he says confidently to wobbles don't you see my boy it's a very cheap way of getting into society he is talking now to sir sandy mchaggis a scottish baronet with a slender purse and a large appetite with whom he has scraped an acquaintance and presented with a spare ticket for the festival knowing that the scotchman is vera fond of a good dinner specially when it costs a mon nothing at all the preparations are now complete and we are in readiness to receive the chairman after a short pause a little door at the end of the room opens and the great man appears attended by an admiring circle of stewards and toadies carrying white wands like a parcel of charity school boys bent on beating the bounds he advances smilingly to his post at the principal table amid deafening and long continued cheers he is a very popular man this chairman for he is not the earl of mount stuart late one of her majesty's cabinet ministers and his wealth and party influence are known to be enormous the dinner now makes its appearance and we yield up ourselves to the enjoyments of eating and drinking these important duties finished and grace having been beautifully sung by the vocalists the real business of the evening commences the usual loyal toasts have been given the noble chairman rises and after passing his fingers through his hair he places his thumbs in the armholes of his waistcoat gives a short preparatory cough accompanied by a vacant stare round the room and commences as follows my lords and gentlemen it is with mingled pleasure and regret that i appear before you this evening of pleasure to find this excellent and world-wide known society is in so promising a condition and of regret that you have not chosen a worthier chairman in fact one who is more capable than myself of dealing with a subject of such vital importance as this loud cheers but although i may be unworthy of the honour i am proud to state that i have been a subscriber to this society from its commencement feeling sure that nothing can tend more to the advancement of civilization social reform fireside comfort and domestic economy among the cannibals that the diffusion of blankets and top boots tremendous cheering which lasts for several minutes here in this england of ours which is an island surrounded by water as i suppose you all know or as our great poet so truthfully and beautifully expresses the same fact england bound in by the triumphant sea what down the long vista of years have conducted more to our successes in arms and arts and song than blankets indeed i never gaze upon a blanket without my thoughts reverting fondly to the days of my early childhood where should we all have been now but for those warm and fleecy coverings my lords and gentlemen our first and tender memories are all associated with blankets blankets when in our nurses arms blankets in our cradles blankets in our cribs blankets to our french bedsteads in our school days and blankets to our marital four posters now therefore i say it becomes our burden duty as men and with feelings of pride i add as englishmen to initiate the untutored savage the wild and somewhat uncultivated denizen of the prairie into the comfort and warmth of blankets and to supply him as far as practicable with these reasonable seasonable luxurious and useful appendages at such a moment as this the lines of another poet strike familiarity upon the ears let me see they are something like this blankets have charms to soothe the savage beast and to to do a i forgot the rest loud cheers 
do we grudge our money for such a purpose i answer fearlessly no could we spend it better at home i reply most emphatically no true it may be said that there are thousands of our own people who at this moment are wandering about the streets of this great metropolis without food to eat or rags to cover them but what have we to do with them our thoughts our feelings and our sympathies are all wafted on the wings of charity to the dear and interesting cannibals in the far-off islands of the green pacific ocean here here besides have not our own poor the workhouses to go to the luxurious straw of the casual wards to repose upon if they please the mutton broth to bathe in and the ever toothsome although somewhat scanty allowance of toke provided for them and let it ever be remembered that our own people are not savages and man-eaters and therefore our philanthropy would be wasted upon them overwhelming applause to return to our subject perhaps some person or persons here may wonder why we should not send out side springs and blutchers as well as top boots to those i will say that top boots alone answer the object desired namely not only to keep the feet dry but the legs warm and thus to combine the double use of shoes and stockings it is not an instance of the remarkable foresight of this society that it purposely abstains from sending out any other than top boots to show the gratitude of the cannibals for the benefits conferred upon them i will just mention that within the last few weeks his illustrious majesty hokey pokey wanky fum the first surnamed by his loving subjects the magnificent from the fact of his wearing on sundays a shirt collar and an eyeglass as full court costume has forwarded the president of this society a very handsome present consisting of two live alligators a boa constrictor and three pots of preserved indian to be eaten with toast and i am told by competent judges that it is quite equal to russian caviar my lords and gentlemen i will not trespass on your patience by making any further remarks knowing how incompetent i am no no i don't mean that how incompetent you all are no i don't mean either but you all know what i mean like the ancient roman lawgiver i am in a peculiar position for the fact is i cannot sit down i mean to say that i cannot sit down without saying that if there ever was an institution it is this institution and therefore i beg to propose prosperity to the society for the distribution of blankets and top boots among the natives of the cannibal islands the toast having been cordially responded to his lordship calls upon mr duffer the secretary to read the report whereupon that gentleman who is of a bland and oily temperament and whose eyes are concealed by a pair of green spectacles produces the necessary document and reads in the orthodox manner thirtieth half-yearly report of the society for the distribution of blankets and top boots to the natives of the cannibal islands the society having now reached its fifteenth anniversary the committee of management beg to congratulate their friends and subscribers on the success that has been attained when the society first commenced its labors the generous and noble-minded natives of the islands together with their king a chief whose name is well known in connection with one of the most stirring and heroic ballads of this country attired themselves in the light but somewhat insufficient costume of their tribe viz little before nothing behind and no sleeves 
with the occasional addition of a pair of spectacles but now thanks to the useful association the upper classes of the cannibals seldom appear in public without their bodies being enveloped in blankets and their feet encased in top boots when the latter useful articles were first introduced into the islands the society's agents had a vast amount of trouble to prevail upon the natives to apply them to their proper purposes and in their work of civilization no less than twenty of its representatives were massacred roasted and eaten but we persevered we overcame the natural antipathy of the cannibals to wear any covering to their feet until a time the natives discovered the warmth and utility of boots and now they can scarcely be induced to remove them until they fall off through old age during the past half year the society has distributed no less than seventy-one blankets and a hundred and twenty-eight pairs of top boots and your committee therefore feels convinced that they will not be accused of inaction but a great work is still before them and they earnestly invite cooperation in order that they may be enabled to supply the whole of the cannibals with these comfortable nutritious and savory articles as the balance sheet is rather a lengthy document i will merely quote a few of the figures for your satisfaction we have received during the half year in subscriptions donations and legacies the sum of five thousand four hundred and three pounds six shillings and eight and three quarter pence rent rates and taxes three hundred and five pounds ten shillings and a quarter pence seventy one pairs of blankets at twenty shillings per pair having taken seventy one pounds exactly and a hundred and twenty eight pairs of top boots at twenty one shillings per pair cost us a hundred and thirty four pounds some odd shillings the salaries and expenses of management amounted to one thousand three hundred and seven pounds four shillings and two and a half pence and sundries which include committee meetings and travelling expenses have absorbed the remainder of the sum and amount to three thousand two hundred and sixty eight pounds nine shillings one and three quarter pence so that we have expanded on the dear and interesting cannibals the sum of two hundred and five pounds and the remainder of the sum amounting to five thousand one hundred and ninety eight pounds has been devoted to the working expenses of the society the reading concluded the secretary resumed his seat amid heavy applause which continues until mr alderman gobbleton rises and in a somewhat lengthy and discursive speech in which the phrases the corporation of the city of london suit and service ancient guild liberties and privileges and court of common council figure frequently states that he agrees with everything the noble chairman has said and has moreover never listened to a more comprehensive and exhaustive document than the one just read which is calculated to satisfy even the most obtuse and hard-headed of individuals gobbleton is a great man of the city he has either been lord mayor or sheriff or something of the sort and as a few words of his go a long way with his friends and admirers his remarks are very favorably received clever man gobbleton says a common councilman sitting near us to his neighbor a languid swell of the period yes very remarkable style of oratory and great fluency replies the other but attention if you please for m hector de longbow the great french writer is on his legs he is staying in england for a short time to be acquainted with our manners and customs 
my lords and gentlemen commences the frenchman elevating his eyebrows and shrugging his shoulders my lords and gentlemen your excellent chairman mr le baron de mont stuart he have to say to me makes me toast then i say to him that i have no toast to us but he mudge my elbow very soft and say that there is von toast that nobody but von frenchman can make proper and therefore with you kind permission i will make the toast de brevity is the soul of defeat as you great philosopher dr johnson do say in that amusing little work of his de pronouncing dictionnaire and therefore i vill not say very much to de point ven i was a boy about so much tall and used to promenade the streets of marseilles eh, of ruin vid no feet to put into my shoe i never to have exposed that this day would to have arrive i vast to begin the world as von garçon or that you call in this country von vater in a cafe where i work very hard vid no abultonments at all to put onto myself and very little food to eat except von old blue balls that vas give to me by de proprietaire just for to keep myself fit to be showed at but thank goodness things they have changed very much for me since that time and i have rose myself sûrement par mon industrie et perseverance loud cheers ah mes amis then i hear to myself the flowing speech de oration magnifique of you lord mayor monsieur gobble down i feel that it is von great privilege for von étranger to sit at the same table and to eat the same food as that grand da majestique man who are de terrier de voleur and de brigands of de metropolis and who is also i for to suppose a halterman and de chef of you common scoundrel my lords and gentlemen i feel that i can perspire to no greater honour than to be von common scoundrelman myself but alas that plaisir are not for me as i are no freemen of your great city not von liveryman servant of von of you companies joint stock but i must not forget the toast milors and gentlemen the immortal shakespeare he have right the ting of beauty are de joy for nevermore it is the ladies who are de toast that is more entrancing da le charlemagne smile de soft voice de vinking eye of de beautiful lady it is de ladies who do sweeten de cares of life it is de ladies who are de guiding stars of our existence it is de ladies who do cheer but not inebriate and de therefore vid all homage to dear sex the toast that i have to propose is the ladies god bless them all and the little frenchman sits down amid a perfect tempest of cheers a few more toasts are given the list of subscriptions is read a vote of thanks is passed to the noble chairman and the fifteenth annual festival of the society for the distribution of blankets and top boots among the natives of the cannibal islands is at an end copyright of mrs f warren and company end of section thirty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c
Section 34 of Humorous Readings and Recitations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Humorous Readings and Recitations, edited by Leopold Wagner. Section 34 acting with a vengeance by w sap june methinks tis a very remarkable sign of the times i must own this expression's not mine how in these latter days the theoretical craze has obtained such a hold on all grades of society and this love of the stage is a mark of the age which is not in accord with my views of propriety. T'was only last week a young lady I know invited the world in a body to go on a wretched wet day to a dull matinee when she made her debut in The Hunchback as Julia, a part which to act is a thing of long practice. Sure ne'er was conceit more absurd or unrulier how can amateur actors commence at the top of the thespian tree and avoid coming flop it would seem very queer if a young volunteer should begin by commanding the royal horse artillery or if babies should bilk their allowance of milk and insist upon sucking from bottles of sillery so it mostly occurs that an amateur errs and gets shaft for possessing less skill than audacity when he tackles a part without learning the art and exposes his natural want of capacity and what is more painful his lack of sagacity i'm bound to admit i was rather once bit by the mania myself in a mild sort of way paid a half-guinea fee to the Zeus ADC, and found myself cast for a part in a play. I think twas the bandit brothers of Brighton, or Eastbourne, or Yarmouth, or Hastings, or Barmouth. I forgot for the moment which place was the right un, but I knew there's a chief who at last comes to grief after numerous blood-curdling adventures and rescues such as frequently writers in modern burlesque use now the part of the chief who comes to grief was secured by a hot-tempered youth named o'keefe in spite of the jealousy of two other fellows he cast himself as the leader without hesitation and resented remarks with extreme indignation so the others were fain their rage to contain and one end accepted the part which was reckoned to be on the whole the one that ranked second the local town hall was engaged which would hold some three hundred people the tickets were sold the purchasers wishing to help the good charity we played for some adding donations and gladding the treasurer's heart to a state of hilarity rehearsals galore were to take place before the debut on the boards of the zeus a d c for the members were earnest as earnest could be well the opening one was rather good fun for we found that the practice of vigorous fighting twits bandits and coast guards was rather exciting but later you know it got rather slow for those who were supers to constantly go and lay the same victims perpetually low with time after time the identical blow but mr o'keefe who played the chief had a time less monotonous greatly than ours and always kept up the rehearsals for hours still he wasn't quite happy and often got snappy for richard McEwen, who wanted to play the part of the chief and used often to say he'd have done it himself in a much better way 
was by no means contented thus feeling superior to play seconds to keith his decided inferior so he did what he could to annoy the great k and misunderstood in a scandalous way all the stage managers proper directions and refused to accept either hints or corrections now in the third act the time being night the scene on the beach there's a hand-to-hand -hand fight twixt the bandit chief that's mr o'keefe and the coast guard captain mr McEwen, in which tis agreed that the first shall succeed while the latter comes in for no end of a hewing but richard McEwen was strong and quick and very good hand with the single stick and he didn't see why he should quietly die by the sword of a man much less clever at fencing so he would give a twist of his muscular wrist which disarmed the brave bandit soon after commencing the rage of o'keefe exceeded belief for McEwen would do it at every rehearsal the manager vowed it could not be allowed and the company protest became universal McEwen explained that he thought the piece gained by his showing his skill how could any one doubt it there's more credit said he to the chief than there'd be if he killed a weak chap who nothing about it and he went on to say that o'keefe wasn't fit for the part of the chief and could not fence a bit o'keefe in reply gave McEwen the lie and vowed he would kick him or otherwise lick him while his eyes flashed like those of a tiger or leopard he induced us to think that his rival must shrink from placing himself in such obvious jeopardy he did so and afterwards things all went smoothly while o'keefe played his part in a matter quite boothly or as somebody said without meaning to gush he'd half put henry irving himself to the blush as soon as the public performance drew nigh the local excitement ran awfully high for reports had been spread by the club be it said that something uncommonly good was expected and so on the day we turned people away from the doors where quite early a crowd had collected well the overture over the drama began but thanks to our casual property man the rise of the curtain was somewhat uncertain in fact for five minutes or so the thing stuck which was terrible luck and affected the play at least so i should say for the opening act went decidedly tamely though o'keefe and his bandits stuck to it most gamely there was not much applause which perhaps was because our audience was certainly very genteel and thought it was rude folks should not show what they feel still we should have preferred some bravos to have heard and two or three gentlemen seem napping we thought might have better employed themselves clapping the first act went badly the second quite dragged the actors worked sadly all interest flagged and though very often we caught people laughing the occasions they chose make us think they were chaffing next came act the third in which the o'keefe was to be very great as the terrible chief for in it he killed his rival and spilled the gore of the coast guards all over the coast and eloped with a bride who beheld him with pride though she could herself of a coronet boast as a matter of fact we hoped that this act would redeem in a measure the ones that preceded and it opened so well and o'keefe looked so swell that at last we obtained the encouragement needed and then came the fight no one thought on that night that McEwen would dare try his veal tour de force and the battle began on the well-hearsed plan while the supers made ready to bear off his course 
whatever induced him to do it who knows he says twas an accident well i suppose when a man tells you that a denial too flat might perhaps lead to arguments even to blows but be that as it may the o'keefe couldn't slay his opponent whose wrist all at once gave a twist and the brave bandit's weapon went flying away the super stood spellbound as over the stage strode the maddened o'keefe in a frenzy of rage he picked up his sword and then went for his foe in terrible earnest oh that was the sternest most truculent fight ever fought in the sight of innocent people who shouted bravo little knowing how soon the real blood was to flow thank heaven the swords were as blunt as two boards otherwise the result would have been simply frightful as it was every whack made the deuce of a crack while the audience considered it clearly delightful with the applause at its height this most bloodthirsty flight by a blow from the skilful McEwen was ended o'keefe fell as if dead with a gash on his head the supers rushed forward the curtain descended talk about clapping and walking stick rapping while even the gentlemen formerly napping bravoed themselves hoarse with the whole of their force and made their fat palms quite tender with slapping o'keefe and McEwen was shouted by all why deuce don't they come and acknowledge the call then some people said that blow on the head was it part of the play or ah see in the hall a youth he's a member as the ribbon shows see to dr pomodor he stealthily goes to the doctor who sat with his coat and his hat just under his seat that he need not delay if a patient should send to fetch him away but who never expected to find in the hall a patient and much less a bandit at all anxiety now takes the place of the row and people talk low and ask shall they go when before the drop curtain there comes with a bow the stage manager suave with a countenance grave to announce that although there's not serious the matter here applause and some chatter still in the late fight the wrong man beat the right and that therefore the show was at end for the night thus the bandit chief came duly to grief though not in the way that the author intended and as for his head ere he went home to bed the doctor had seen that twas properly mended this friends was the end of the drama for me and for most i believe the of the zeus a d c who needed of success may indeed have been less than that usually obtained by such clubs and societies but be that as it may i have err from that day placed amateur acting among the improprieties end of section thirty four recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter 35 of Humorous Readings and Recitations by Leopold Wagner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox 4. Humorous Readings and Recitations, edited by Leopold Wagner. Chapter 35 My Fortnight at Wretchedville by George Augustus Sala How I came to be acquainted with Wretchedville was in this wise. I was in a quest last autumn of a nice quiet place within a convenient distance of town where I could finish an epic poem or stay, was it a five-act drama? on which I had been long engaged, 
and where I could be secure from the annoyance of organ grinders and of reverend gentlemen leaving little subscription books one day and calling for them the next. I pined for a place where one could be very snug and where one's friends didn't just drop in just to look you up, old fellow, and where the post didn't come in too often. So I picked up a bag of needments and availing myself of a midday train on the great Dom Daniel Railway, alighted haphazard at a station. It turned out to be Sobbington. I saw at a glance that Sobbington was too fashionable, not to say stuck up, for me. The waltz from Faust was piano fortetically audible from at least half a dozen semi-detached windows, and this combined with some painful variations on take then the sabre and a cursory glance into a stationer's shop and fancy warehouse where two stern mummers of low church aspect were purchasing the back numbers of the new Pugwell Square pulpit and three young ladies were telegraphically inquiring behind their parents backs of the young person at the counter whether any letters had been left for them, sufficed to accelerate my departure from Sobbington. The next station on the road, I was told, was Doleful Hill, and then came Deadwood Junction. I thought I would take a little walk and see what the open and what the covert yielded. I left my bag with a moody porter at the Sobbington station, and trudged along the road which had been indicated to me as leading to Doleful Hill. It is true that I had not the remotest idea of where I was going to live. I walked onwards and onwards, admiring the field cows in the far-off pastures, cows the white specks on whose hides recurred so artistically that one might have thought the scenic arrangement of the landscape had been entrusted to Mr. Burkett Foster. Anon, I saw coming towards me a butcher boy in his cart, drawn by a fast-trotting pony. I asked him when he neared me how far it might be to Doleful Hill. Oh, good two mile, quoth the butcher boy, pulling up. But you'll have to pass Wretchedville first. Lays in a hole a little to the left, half a mile on. Wretchedville, thought I. What an odd name. What sort of place is it? I inquired. Well, replied the butcher boy, it's a lively place. A very lively place, I should say. It was lively enough to make a cricket burst himself for spite. It's so uncommon lively. And with this enigmatical deliverance, the butcher boy relapsed into a whistle of the utmost shrillness and rattled away towards Sobbington. I wish that it had not been quite so golden an afternoon. A little dullness, a few clouds in the sky, might have acted as a caveat against Wretchedville. But I plodded on and on, finding all things looking beautiful in that autumn glow, until at last I found myself descending the declivitous road into Wretchedville, and to destruction. Were there any apartments to let? Of course there were. The very first house I came to was, as regards the parlour window, nearly blocked up by a placard treating of apartments furnished. Am I right in describing it as the parlour window? I scarcely know, for the front door, with which it was on a level, was approached by such a very steep flight of steps that when you stood on the topmost grade, it seemed as though, with a very slight effort, you could have peeped in at the bedroom window, or touched one of the chimney pots, while, as concerns the basement, the front kitchen, oh, I beg pardon, the breakfast parlour, appeared to be a good way above the level of the street. The space in the first floor window, not occupied by the placard, was filled by a monstrous group of wax fruit, the lemons as big as pumpkins, and the leaves of an unnaturally vivid green. The window below, 
it was a single windowed front, served merely as a frame for the half-length portrait of a lady in a cap, ringlets, and a colossal cameo brooch. The eyes of this portrait were fixed upon me, and before almost I had lifted a very small light knocker, decorated, so far as I could make out, with the cast-iron effigy of a desponding ape, and had struck this against a door which, to judge from the amount of percussion produced, was composed of bristol board highly varnished. The portal itself flew open, and the portrait of the basement appeared in the flesh. Indeed, it was the same portrait. Downstairs it had been Mrs. Primpris looking out into the Wretchedville Road for lodgers. Upstairs it was Mrs. Primpris letting her lodgings and glorying in the act. She didn't ask for any references. She didn't hasten to inform me that there were no children or any other lodgers. She didn't look doubtful when I told her that the whole of my luggage consisted of a black bag which I had left at the Sobbington station. She seemed rather pleased with the idea of the bag, and said that her Alfred should step round for it. She didn't object to smoking, and she at once invested me with the order of the latchkey. A latchkey at Wretchedville! Ha! <laughs> she further held me with her glittering eye, and I listened like a two-years child while she let me the lodgings for a fortnight certain. She had converted me into a single gentleman lodger of quiet and retired habits. Or was I a widower of independent means, seeking a home in a cheerful family, so suddenly that I beheld all things as in a dream, thinking, perchance, that the first stone of that monumental edifice the bill could not be laid too quickly, she immediately provided me with tea. There was a little cottage loaf, so hard, round, shiny, and compact, that I experienced a well-nigh uncontrollable desire to fling it up to the ceiling to ascertain whether it would chip off any portion of a preposterous rosette in stucco in the centre, representing a sunflower surrounded by cabbage leaves. This terrible ornament was, by the way, one of the chief sources of my misery at Wretchedville. I was continually apprehensive that it would tumble down bodily on the table. In addition to the cottage loaf, there was a pretentious teapot, which, had it been of sterling silver, would have been worth fifty guineas, but which, in its ghastly gleaming, said plainly, Sheffield, and imposture. There was a piece of butter in a shape like a diminutive haystack, and with a cow sprawling on the top in unctuous plasticity. It was a pallid kind of butter, from which, with difficulty, you shaved off adiposerous scales, which would not be persuaded to adhere to the bread, but flew off at tangents, and went rolling about an intolerably large tea-tray, on whose papier-mâché surface was depicted the death of Captain Headley Vickers. The Crimean sky was inlaid with mother-of-pearl, and the gallant captain's face was highly enriched with blue and crimson foil paper. As for the tea, I don't think I ever tasted such a peculiar mixture. Did you ever sip warm catsup sweetened with borax? That might have been something like it. And what was that sediment strongly resembling the sand at Great Yarmouth at the bottom of the cup? I sat down to my meal, however, and made as much play with the cottage loaf as I could. Had the loaf been varnished? It smelt and looked as though it had undergone that process. Everything in the house smelt of varnish. I was uncomfortably conscious, too, during my repast, one side of the room, being all window, that I was performing the part of a portrait of the gentleman on the first floor, and that as such I was sitting, 
to Mrs. Lucknow at number 12, opposite. I knew her name was Lucknow, for a brass plate on the door said so, whose own half-length effigy was visible in her own breakfast parlour window, glowering at me reproachfully, because I had not taken her first floor, in the window of which was not a group of wax fruit, but a sham alabaster vase full of artificial flowers. Every window in Wretchedville exhibited one or the other of these ornaments, and it was from their contemplation that I began to understand how it was that the fancy goods trade in the minories and Houndsditch throve so well. They made things there to be purchased by the housekeepers of Wretchedville. The shades of evening fell, and Mrs. Primpress brought me in a monstrous paraffin lamp, the flame of which wouldn't do anything but lick the chimney glass till it smoked it to the proper hue to observe eclipses by, and then splutter into extinction and charnel-like odour. After that, we tried a couple of composites, six to the pound, in green glass candlesticks. I asked Mrs. Primpress if she could send me up a book to read, and she favoured me, per Alfred and Selina, with her whole library, consisting of the Asylum Press Almanac for 1860, two odd volumes of the Calcutta Directory, the Brewer and Distiller's Assistant, Julia de Crespigny, or A Winter in London, de Noyer's French Idioms, and the Reverend Mr. Huntington's Bank of Faith. I took out my cigar case after this and began to smoke, and then I heard Mrs. Primpress coughing and a number of doors being thrown wide open. Upon this I concluded that I would go to bed. My sleeping apartment, the first floor back, was a perfect cube. One side was a window overlooking a strip of clay soil hemmed in between brick walls. And there were no tombstones yet, but if it wasn't a cemetery, why, when I opened the window to get rid of the odour of the varnish, did it smell like one? The opposite side of the cube was composed of a chest of drawers. I am not impertinently curious by nature, but as I was the first floor lodger, I bethought myself entitled to open the top long drawer with a view to the bestowal of the contents of my black bag. The drawer was not empty, but that which it held made me feel very nervous. I suppose the weird figure I saw stretched out there with pink arms and legs sprouting from a shroud of silver paper, a quantity of ghastly auburn curls, and two blue glass eyes unnaturally gleaming in the midst of a mask of salmon-coloured wax, was Selina's best doll. The present, perhaps, of her uncle, who was, haply, a Calcutta director, or an Asylum Press almanac maker, or a brewer and distiller, or a cashier in the Bank of Faith. I shut the drawer again hurriedly, and that doll in its silver paper cerecloth haunted me all night. The third side of my bedroom consisted of chimney, the coldest, hardest, brightest-looking fireplace I ever saw out of Hampton Court Palace guardroom. The fourth side was door. I forget into which corner was hitched a wash-hand stand. The ceiling was mainly stucco rosette, of the pattern of the one in my sitting-room. Among the crazes which came over me at this time was one to the effect that this bedroom was a cabin on board ship, and that if the ship should happen to lurch or roll in the trough of the sea, I must infallibly tumble out of the door, or the window, or into the drawer where the doll was, unless the drawer and the doll came out to me, or up the chimney. I think that I murmured, Steady, 
as I clomb into bed. My couch, an Arabian one, Mrs. Primpris said proudly, seemingly consisted of the Logan, or celebrated rocking stone of Cornwall, loosely covered with bleached canvas, under which was certain loose foreign matter, but whether composed of flocculi of wool or of the halves of kidney potatoes, I am not in a position to state. At all events, I awoke in the morning, veined all over, like a scagliola column. I never knew, too, before, that any blankets were manufactured in Yorkshire, or anywhere else, so remarkably small and thin as the two seeming flannel pocket handkerchiefs with blue and crimson edging, which formed part of Mrs. Primpress's Arabian bed furniture. Nor had I hitherto been aware, as I was when I lay with that window at my feet, that the moon was so very large. The orb of night seemed to tumble on me flat until I felt as though I were lying in a cold frying pan. It was a watery moon, I have reason to think, for when I awoke the next morning, much battered with visionary conflicts with the doll, I found that it was raining cats and dogs. The rain, the poet tells us, it raineth every day. It rained most prosaically all that day at Wretchedville, and the next, and from Monday morning till Saturday night, and then until the middle of the next week. Dear me, dear me, how wretched I was! I hasten to declare that I have no kind of complaint to make against Mrs. Primpress. Not a flea was felt in her house. The cleanliness of the villa was so scrupulous as to be distressing. It smelt of soap and scrubbing brush, like a refuge. Mrs. Primpress was strictly honest, even to the extent of inquiring what I would like to have done with the fat of cold mutton chops, and sending me up antediluvian crusts, the remnants of last week's cottage loaves, with which I would play moodily at knock em downs, using the pepper caster as a pin. I have nothing to say against Alfred's fondness for art. India rubber, to be sure, is apter to smear than to obliterate drawings in chalk, but a threepenny piece is not much, and you cannot too early encourage the imitative faculties. And again, if Selina did require correction, I am not prepared to deny that a shoe may be the best implement and the blade bones the most fitting portion of the human anatomy for such an exercitation. I merely say that I was wretched at Wretchedville, and that Mrs. Primpress's apartments very much aggravated my misery. The usual objections taken to a lodging house are to the effect that the furniture is dingy, the cooking execrable, the servant a slattern, and the landlady either a crocodile or a tigress. Now, my indictment against my Wretchedville apartments simply amounts to this that everything was too new. Never were there such staring paper hangings, such gaudily printed druggets for carpets, such blazing hearth rugs, one representing the dog of Montargis, seizing the murderer of the forest of Bondy, such gleaming fire irons, and such remarkably shiny looking-glasses with gilt halters for frames. The crockery was new, and the glue on the chairs and tables was scarcely dry. The new veneer peeled off the new chiffonier. The roller-blinds to the windows were so new that they wouldn't work. The new stair carpeting used to dazzle my eyes so that I was always tripping myself up, the new oilcloth in the hall smelt like the Trinity House repository for new boys. And Mrs. Primpress was always fully dressed by nine o'clock in the morning. 
she confessed once or twice during my stay that her house was not quite seasoned it was not even seasoned to sound every time the kitchen fire was poked you heard the sound in the sitting-room as to perfumes whenever the lid of the copper in the wash-house was raised the first-floor lodger was aware of the fact i knew by the simple evidence of my olfactory organs what mrs primpress had for dinner every day pork accompanied by some green esculent boiled predominated when my fortnight's tenancy had expired i never went outside the house until i left it for good and my epic poem or whatever it was had more or less been completed i returned to london and had a rare bilious attack the doctor said it was painter's colic i said at the time it was disappointed ambition for the booksellers had looked very coldly on my poetical proposals and the managers to a man had refused to read my play but at this present writing i believe the sole cause of my malady to have been wretchedville i hope they will pull down the villas and build the jail there soon and that the rascal convicts will be as wretched as i was End of chapter 35、section、36 of Humorous Readings and Recitations This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. Humorous Readings and Recitations, edited by Leopold Wagner, section 36, The Sorrows of Werther, by W. M. Thackeray. Werther had a love for Charlotte, such as words could never utter. Would you know how first he met her? She was cutting bread and butter. Charlotte was a married lady, and a moral man was Werther, and for all the wealth of Indies, would do nothing for to hurt her so he sighed and pined and ogled and his passion boiled and bubbled till he blew his silly brains out and no more was by it troubled charlotte having seen his body borne before her on a shudder like a well-conducted person went on cutting bread and butter End of section thirty six Recording by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. Section thirty seven of Humorous Readings and Recitations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Humorous Readings and Recitations. Edited by Leopold Wagner. Section 37. Moral Music by an Experimenter. I am in a humble sphere of life, a hairdresser's assistant, in fact, but I have a thirst for improving my mind and regularly attend the evening classes at our institute. It was there I read in a magazine about morals and music the writer discussed the question whether music by itself unpolluted by words had any mental significance or moral power i left off reading rather puzzled but i am of a practical turn of mind i joined our bricklaying class at the institute last term and although i knit my fingers a good deal still it has made me inclined to put all new truths to the test of experiment so i determined to experiment on myself and see what mental significance and moral power music possessed if any i regulated my life very carefully during the trial so that no outside influence should spoil the result i weighed and measured out my food and drink abstained from pickles and sensation literature denied myself the exciting pleasure of jemima's company on thursday and sunday and to counterbalance the language of some of our ruder customers and to give morals an even chance i slept with a tract under my pillow 
i started with a quite unprejudiced mind for the attention i had paid to music before was mostly measured by the loudness of it i took a seat at st james's hall in good time and opened my mind and morals for impressions first of all a man came on the platform and began as far as i could see to tune the piano i thought he ought to have done this before the advertised time of opening but when he got off the stool the people began to applaud him and on inquiring i found that the man had taken for the tuner was really the giver of the concert and that he had been playing one of his own compositions so i lost this experiment altogether however soon after the player returned with the violinist and they started a duet i set my teeth if there was any significance or moral in a violin and piano mixed i determined to have it i had first fleeting visions before my mind of all the creatures i had ever seen in pain there was the squeak of a rat caught in a trap there was the same sort of shriek jemima gave when i took her to have a tooth out and there was the loud wail which accompanies the conversion of pig into pork but this was only the first chapter the players stopped and began again and the next chapter plunged me among the industrial arts under the influence of the magic instruments i saw the foundation of england's greatness there was an athletic carpenter industriously sawing wood there was a grindstone putting an edge on an axe there were a number of whirs which brought back vividly a loom i had seen at work at an exhibition and there was a rather asthmatic smith striking his anvil and coughing between every blow but this was not all they began a third chapter and i was immediately among lollipops all the nicest things i had ever tasted stood before me in a row there was a pot full of apricot jam there was some roast beef gravy than which taken on the knife i know nothing more toothsome there was a sixpenny strawberry ice and a nice cut of lamb and mint sauce to finish up with i was sorry when they left off but glad to find i was on the trace of a moral the piece was evidently a musical embodiment of a clean shave the first part was the misery of laying your head back and having your nose tweaked the second was being scraped and the last was the happy moment when you stretch your limbs pass your satisfied hand over your smooth chin and nod to yourself complacently in the glass the moral was obvious that it is a duty to get shaved and not to shave yourself but to go to the professional man my next experiment was to hear a young lady sing she came on the platform looking lovely and she had on a sash and a dress improver that i never saw equalled for elegance my hopes rose at the sight of her i felt sure that so much beauty could not be otherwise than moral oh do be moral do be moral i kept saying to myself as the accompanist opened fire on her song a dreadful thought then arose the words of her song would taint the experiment which was to be on music alone but to my delight i could not catch a word of what she sang it was all pure music her sweet song suggested to me as follows i first saw her running upstairs and down again as fast as ever she could and then she sat down on the mat to rest while the piano panted then she drew out from somewhere one long straight note thick in the middle and tapering off at each end so seductive that i fancied myself a storm-tossed mariner listening to a mermaid i could almost feel the waves of the margate boat gurgling around me then she drew a jug of hot water out of the boiler at least that was its intellectual significance to me because the note went steadily rising upwards with little splashes in between just like the sound of the water when i draw a jug to shave a customer then she ran upstairs again like lightning and disappeared through the tiles while the pianist banged the front door to i am sure there was a splendid moral to all this for she looked so beautiful and smiled so sweetly but i am undecided whether the moral was that i was to sign the pledge or that i was not to go to concerts without jemima as a safeguard i next gave myself up bodily to what they called a concerto when i saw several gentlemen come on to the platform with a variety of instruments i thought it would be a more serious experiment than the others and so it proved i kept my eyes on them when they first began but they looked so comical one with his cheeks blown out another with his hair as if it had just been machined 
another trying to get his arm round his fiddle's waist and another jerking his eyes out of his head that i felt it was not giving the music a fair chance so i shut my own eyes tight as soon as i had done so there was no end of intellectual significance i was in a pleasure van just starting for hampton court with jemima there was the jog trot of the horses and every now and then the skid put on there was laughter and the puffing of pipes and occasionally a loud roar as we crossed a big thoroughfare we soon got into the country and heard the birds chirping and there was a sweet gurgling sound which intimated to me that the men on the box had broached the four-gallon cask i was just getting ready for a glass when all at once the whole scene vanished the music had stopped and when it began again things were much altered for the worse with the first note i felt a shudder go down my vitals something was coming i did not know what i felt just like being woke up in bed by a strange noise and no matches handy and my razors open to everybody on the table then i heard the bass fiddle say distinctly prepare to meet your doom several times over while the violins tried to sneer at me and the piano rattled chains in the corner this was very trying but worse was to follow there were faint cries and sobs from the next room as though murder was going on there were long silences which were worse to bear than any sound then someone began to work softly at the door with a centre bit and there were rumblings as though someone else was letting himself down the chimney i fancied i could almost see his leg then there was another hush and thank heaven i could tell by the hand clapping that the part was over it was about time for the mental significance had got quite overpowering there was then a total change the music took me back in a second to the last ball i had been to the eighteen penny one refreshments extra i was dancing all the dances at once and all the girls were making up to me and it only made jemima smile that was a really delightful mental significance and i could have done with more of it but i doubt whether the concerto on the whole was moral i am sure that ice down the back cannot be good for any one nor can i see in cool moments that raising the animal spirit so many degrees above proof is proper i have not yet concluded my experiments i have still to try the effects of a cornet solo and the flute as well as the concertina the bones and the banjo but i have no doubt that if more people would try my plan and honestly state the results we should in time get at the truth of this matter of moral music from the evening standard end of section thirty seven Section 38 of Humorous Readings and Recitations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Humorous Readings and Recitations. Edited by Leopold Wagner. Section 38. Billy Dumps the Tailor by Charles Clark. Billy Dumps was very fond of spending his evenings with his two cronies natty dyer a shoemaker and netty tooson an umbrella mender at the cunning cat just round the corner this worthy trio seldom left their favorite haunt before closing time much to the disgust of their respective helpmates mrs dumps in particular billy dumps was a tailor working as he termed it on his own hook as his prices were moderate and his work durable he earned a pretty good living making and mending for his neighbors chiefly of the dock laboring class but his nightly orgies at the cunning cat made sad inroads into his hard earnings which tended much to sour betsy's otherwise naturally good temper the climax was reached one eventful evening on the occasion of a free and easy being held at the old quarters after which billy for prudential reasons was escorted home at midnight by his two associates all fully bent on informing the sleepy neighborhood at the top of their voices that they were jolly good fellows supplemented by a further assertion of and so say all of us finishing up by depositing the confiding tailor at full length in his own front passage through the door being inadvertently left ajar where he laid and snored in blissful ignorance of the trials and troubles of his life until rather rudely awakened and then somewhat briskly assisted upstairs by betsy and a broom-handle 
now mr billy dumps i am tired of sitting up for you night after night and mean to do so no longer so if you are not in when our clock strikes ten i locks the door and you finds other lodgings exclaimed betsy his wife on the morning after the free and easy taylor dumps felt small after the previous night's dissipation and determined to get home earlier and sober that evening but under the influence of the soothing pipe the nut-brown ale and the merry laugh and jest of his boon companions he was induced to forget his late resolution and to prolong his stay at the cunning cat until aroused to the fact that it was ten o'clock and closing time on reaching home all was still and dark strange he went round to the back door and thumped loudly the bedroom casement flew open with a bang from which instantly protruded the night-capped head of the wife of his bosom billy at once tried the high hand shouting now then sleepy what's your game be spry and open sharp no she wasn't going to be spry neither was she sleepy and as to her little game she had locked him out according to promise so didn't intend unlocking again that night not if she knew it oh no now betsy don't be a fool you'll repent it he urged she wasn't a fool she answered in her opinion he was the biggest fool to be hammering and shivering outside at that time of night when he might have been comfortably lying in a warm bed hours ago as for repentance she thought that would be more on his side of the door for she felt comfortable very billy fumed and stormed and fully felt the ridiculousness of his position especially as he heard sounds of the neighboring casement stealthily unclose and suppressed indications of merriment issuing therefrom but billy stormed to no purpose betsy coolly recommended him to go back where he had spent such a pleasant evening she was sure mrs mudge the landlady would be only too pleased to accommodate him with a lodging if she wasn't she ought to be considering the time and money he spent in her house but billy had his own ideas of that arrangement so still lingered determined to try another tact he promised amendment but betsy was sceptical he appealed to her feelings let me in betsy for i am cold that she could not help as he had made his bed so he must lie he then became affectionate oh betsy you are unkind remember old times remember our wedding day he pleaded thinking to touch her that way but betsy was not going to be had by soft sodder for she promptly rejoined remember our wedding day you drunken sot i do to my sorrow no fear of my forgetting that great mistake but as i told you before into this house this blessed night you do not step no not if you were to go on your knees and beg for it ah betsy you'll be sorry for this when too late i'm determined to end my misery i'll jump down the well and drown myself and you'll be the cause of it whined billy the night was dark betsy felt a little relenting as she heard her husband groping about in the woodshed then she could dimly discern him making for the well plainly hear the creaking of the hinges and the lid thrown back with a thud then came the cry of good-bye betsy i'm gone the dull sound of a heavy body plunging into the water a gasping moan and all was still betsy's old affection for her erring husband at once returned with tenfold force for she raced downstairs rushing into the darkness shrieking for help the neighbors were aroused men and women tumbled out of their back doors in such scanty dishable that would have charmed a sculpture betsy still screeching like a bagpipe had to be forcibly restrained from jumping to the rescue by the bystanders dick ward the blacksmith thrust the bucket pole into the well singing out lay hold billy if ye ain't too fur gone i can feel un shouted dick as the pole struck some hard substance with a sounding smack my eye dick he'll feel you too if that's billy's head you tapped said nat it ud be one for his knob and no mistake they caught a glimpse by the uncertain light of a flaming candle of a something floating low on the surface of the water his head feels as hard as a coker nut said dick as the pole rattled on the dark object why it seems off his shoulders for it goes bobbing up and down like a dumplin in a soup kettle just then to the astonishment of all the well-known voice of billy dumps was heard from the identical bedroom window that his wife had so lately vacated shouting hello you people 
what the deuce are ye makin such a rumpus for a ghost a ghost was the cry no fear laughed the tailor but dick as you have the pole in hand i should feel obliged if you'd fish up my chopping block which i dropped in there a while ago betsy dumps at the sound of her husband's voice made for the door but found it fastened let me in let me in i am so glad you are safe she joyously exclaimed not if i know it betsy it's my turn now into this house this blessed night you do not step no not if you were to go on your knees and beg for it a loud laugh broke from the crowd as the joke dawned on them betsy was being paid back in her own coin the neighborhood had been sold the crafty tailor had secured the chopping block from the wood shed and popped it down the well as his substitute then in the darkness and confusion slipped back into the house unseen betsy having been accommodated for the night by a friendly neighbor the crowd dispersed highly amused at the adventure early the next morning mrs dumps on returning home was surprised to find her husband up a cheerful fire burning and the breakfast ready taking her hand he gave her a hearty kiss with this greeting dear old woman let bygones be bygones and they were too for from that time the cunning cat knew him no more it struck him strongly that his wife's true affection shown in the hour of his supposed great danger was too precious to trifle with as a proof that he kept his word let it be added that any one visiting the large thriving tailoring establishment in the high street would hardly recognize in the respectable dapper proprietor mr william dumps the once drunken tailor so long a nightly nuisance to the neighborhood by permission of the author end of section thirty eight Section number 39 of Humorous Readings and Recitations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Humorous Readings and Recitations. Edited by Leopold Wagner section thirty nine on punning by theodore hook my little dears who learn to read pray early learn to shun that very silly thing indeed which people call a pun read antics rules and twill be found how simple an offence it is to make the self same sound afford a double sense for instance ale may make you ail your aunt an aunt may kill you in a veil may buy a veil and bill may pay the bill or if to france your bark may steer as dover it may be a peer appears upon the pier who blind still goes to sea thus one may say when to a treat good friends accept our greeting tis meet that men who meet to eat should eat their meat when meeting brawn on the boards no bore indeed although from boar prepared nor can the fowl on which we feed foul feeding he declared this one ripe fruit may be a pear and yet be pared again and still no one which seemeth rare until we do explain it therefore should be all your aim to spell with ample care for who however fond of game would choose to swallow hair a fat man's gait may make a smile who has no gait to close the farmer sitting on his stile no stylish person knows perfumers men of sense must be some silly men are bright a brown man oft deep breed we see a black a wicked white most wealthy men good manners have however vulgar they an actor still the harder slave the oftener they play so poets can't the bays obtain unless their tailors choose 
while grooms and coachmen not in vain each evening seek the muse the dyer who by dying lives a dire life maintains the glazier it is known receives his profits for his pains by gardeners time is tied tis true when spring is in its prime but time and tide won't wait for you if you are tied for time thus now you see my little dears the way to make a pun a trick which you through coming years should sedulously shun the fault admits of no defence for where so or tis found you sacrifice the sound for sense the sense is never sound so let your words and actions too one single meaning prove and just in all you say or do you'll gain esteem and love in mirth and play no harm you know when duty's task is done but parents ne'er should let you go unpunished for a pun end of section thirty nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc